All right. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the 10th installment of our rulemaking meeting series. I'm Ariel Finney, the Washington CARES Fund Policy and Rules Manager with the Department of Social and Health Services. Today, we will be recapping the rulemaking meeting series and finishing with a brief discussion. This session was originally planned to allow time to finish any incomplete discussions, but thankfully, we've had plenty of time in each session to cover the topics that we've needed. Uh, so we do have some discussion points here at the end of the presentation in the same format we've been following. Um, so please stick around for those if you can. Um, very excited to uh, you know, wrap the series up and um, hear some final thoughts. Before I go further, though, I do want to say thank you to everyone who has been participating uh, in these sessions. Um, I know there's been a lot of material to cover. There's been a um, lot of questions asked of each of you. Uh, but really the information we've received throughout these sessions have been in, has been invaluable. And I really wanna say um, thank you again, and that we're really lucky to have so many people invested in the success of this program and willing to take time out of their day to be here and share their thoughts when it comes to rulemaking and the Washington CARES Fund program. We have the agenda up here on the slide for you. It's gonna be a brief agenda. Um, we're going to follow a similar format as we've done in the past with a few different uh, few tweaks. We'll cover some housekeeping. We'll go over governance and definitions. We'll recap uh, the meeting series uh, so far, and then we'll end on a few uh, discussion questions here. This session is scheduled for two hours, but I expect we're going to finish well within an hour. I think this is going to be fairly straightforward, but it always depends on our discussion at the end, which is really um, where we will use the majority of our time. Uh, so we'll see what folks have to say, and we have plenty of time for discussion if needed. Some housekeeping before we begin. The question and answer feature is available for questions throughout the presentation. I will be opening up the chat feature when we get to the discussion section. When I have prompts and questions for you all, uh, we'll open up the chat so you can participate via chat. We'll also talk about how to participate by coming off of mute and sharing verbally as well. The purpose of this meeting is to hear ideas from the public about rulemaking for DSHS uh, Washington CARES Fund rulemaking. If you have questions about the program or you're wanting to learn more about the program, please email uh, wacares at dshs.wa.gov and they'll be able to answer any program related questions. Today we're here to talk about rulemaking specifically for DSHS. As a reminder, Employment Security Department is also doing rulemaking for uh, the Washington CARES Fund program. So if you're interested in their rulemaking activities, I will be sharing some resources here at the end so you'll be able to connect with them. We do have recordings of past sessions available on our Washington CARES Fund rulemaking site. Um, so you'll be able to go to the link above here on the or go to the link in the slide deck here and um, see any of their past uh, presentations. You can watch the recordings. You can also just pull up the slide deck. Um, so if you've missed any along the way, please feel free to go back and um, take a look at the areas of interest to you or things that you feel like are um, potentially relevant to your experiences or your work. Uh, we are still looking for any comments. If you have any, um, there's still plenty of time to submit comments to us, and you'll be able to submit those directly to me at ariel.finney2 at dshs.wa.gov. Um, so please feel free to submit comments. We are moving forward on our drafting right now, um, but there'll still be time, and we're still very interested to hear comments as we go through our initial drafts and um, working through uh, getting those ready to go for the rulemaking process. I also want to uh, check in about signing up for notifications. Um, we are gonna be doing a lot of communication through our Gov Delivery account. And I wanna make sure if you're interested in rulemaking for DSHS, Washington CARES Fund, um, that you make sure that you are signed up for our notifications. So you can do that by going to the website listed up on the screen here, uh, which is wacaresfund.wa.gov forward slash rulemaking. And in there, there will be a, um, an area that you can, there'll be a link in there that says, you know, confirm you're signed up or sign up for rulemaking updates. And you'll see the screen pop up where I have a little uh, screen, a little snip of that. 
and make sure that that box at the bottom there, DSHS rulemaking is clicked. We'll be communicating again about uh, um, any future rulemaking activities, uh, whether it's the stuff that we've talked about so far, moving forward into the CR 102 process, or um, new and you know other material that we're going to be developing for rulemaking as we um, understand more what our rulemaking needs are going to be. Uh, so please make sure that you are signed up. That's the one thing if uh, that I hope that you really take away from today is make sure that you're signed up for rulemaking notifications through our Gov Delivery um, Listserv. And that way we can communicate in the future with you. You'll know what we're up to. And as we hold future listening sessions, um, you'll be able to join those as well. All right, let's talk a little bit about the governance and definitions. Um, we had uh, we have this as part of our rulemaking plans, and so we wanted to take a moment to talk a little bit about what this will mean when we say governance and definitions. Um, to start off with, we're going to talk a little bit about governance, and this is going to be a section in our chapter uh, that's really just going to orient you to the chapter itself. So we don't really have a lot of questions or a lot of material to talk about here because it's going to be fairly straightforward, um, or at least that'll be my, my famous last words as uh, we work on developing this. But we're going to be referencing back to our statute, which is Chapter 50B04, RCW, which gives us the authority for doing rulemaking. Um, that way folks can understand when we're doing this chapter of WAC, um, where our authority comes from as the department to make these rules. We're also going to include a citation to Employment Security Department and Healthcare Authority rules. Um, healthcare Authority is not expected to do rulemaking until 2025, so we're going to be working on making sure that they're connected to our chapter as we move forward. Um, but we do want to make sure that from a user perspective, you're able to easily navigate between rules for each program that's involved in rulemaking for Washington Cares Fund. Um, and so for those of, you, uh, uh, those of you who may be joining us for the first time, the Employment Security Department has um, a major role within the Washington Cares Fund uh, project. They're going to be leading the work on employee, employee contributions. Um, healthcare Authority is another department responsible for a major part of the Washington Cares Fund program. Uh, they're going to be responsible for payment system, verifying, verifying use of benefits, and establishing criteria for payment of benefits to providers. Um, so as such, they each have sections of rulemaking that they're going to be doing that's going to be overlapping um, in subject matter as far as the Washington Cares Fund program with our chapter at the, the Department of Social and Health Services. So we want to make sure that uh, users are able to navigate through to other, you know, other uh, relevant chapters. Um, and hopefully that'll help keep everybody connected because I know it can be challenging to navigate between different departments and uh, the different um, rules that are out there. We'll also include a purpose statement, which just gives an idea of what will be, uh, you know, be within this chapter. Um, what's the purpose of our rulemaking? Uh, so fairly brief, fairly straightforward. Um, but I think this is always an important section that can be easily overlooked in rulemaking. Um, really, again, thinking about the user experience and you all interacting with this chapter, what will that feel like and how can you easily navigate it? So um, not nearly as exciting as the rest of the material we've covered, but I think that governance piece um, will be helpful and we'll be working on making sure that that's in place as we um, get all these pieces put together uh, for our chapter. I was hoping today to have more to present on definitions, but we are, as I mentioned before, in the early stages of drafting our rules. And as such, we're in the early stages of drafting our definitions. So at this point, we don't have any definitions to um, share today other than the stuff that we've covered already. Um, we talked about approved services early on and the definitions um, at that time, they were very much working definitions and we're still finalizing those. Uh, but we are hoping that as we continue to work on our rules, uh, we get these definitions um, built out and then they will be part of the review process, of course, as we uh, move to uh, get, get our uh, language finalized. So stay tuned for that. Um, but if you are interested in some of the definitions we've talked about before, feel free to go back to past sessions. Um, well, again, they're all still very much working drafts. Uh, we did cover some of them along the way, particularly around approved services. Um, so more to come. 
And uh, stay again, make sure you signed up for notifications about rulemaking. So you'll be able to uh, see when we're having, when things are getting published and be able to provide feedback. I will add here though, um, even though we're not gonna be covering this in great detail um, with definitions today, very, very interested in hearing feedback around definitions, things that you think are gonna be important for us to consider um, or definitions that you're saying, hey, if you're gonna use this kind of definition, take the, consider this. Um, I'm still very curious to hear feedback. Um, so feel free to share that uh, either at the end of this as we get into our discussion play, our points um, or via email, um, you're welcome to share any ideas you have around how to make sure we have uh, supportive definitions in our chapter. All right, I wanna take a minute or two to recap where we've been so far. Um, hopefully, my, my hope here is that this will help orient you if you've not been able to attend each session uh, to the type of material that's out there right now, um, but also to get, kind of help you understand what we're hearing uh, from these sessions um, kind of at a high level, but give you an idea of the themes we've seen. So we've covered the topics here on the screen. We did an overview of rulemaking, uh, which really just helped us understand like what's the program? What are we here for? Why are we meeting? Um, gave, gave us a sense of rulemaking uh, from start to finish at, at again at a high level. Um, but that initial um, session I think can be really helpful to orient to the rest of the meetings that we've done as well as some good information good questions at the end around uh, rules as a whole um, kind of at a general level. We had two sessions about approved services where we talked in much more detail around each approved services the proposed you know the working definition at that time um, and then also the things we need to consider when it comes to those approved services what else do we need to be thinking about uh, when it comes to approved services um, for each approved service itself, but also just globally, are there other things we need to be considering? We talked about applying for services and eligibility criteria. This was focused around ben the beneficiary experience for applying for services, as well as um, what it means to be eligible for the program. Uh, so we, again, focused on the beneficiary here and what that would look like for them to be navigating the system and starting to receive their benefit. The next one was regarding assessments, and uh, this is, again, beneficiary assessments when it comes to that functional eligibility criteria uh, that's listed in our uh, statute under Chapter 50 B04 RCW that says they must, beneficiaries must meet the requirements uh, for um, uh, for the certain to be to become approved for services, and so those assessments are going to be a big part of that. Um, so we talked about assessments, the things that we need to be considering around that. Um, so I think that's another really helpful one that if you have a moment to go back and look at, that would be great to hear any feedback you have. We talked about beneficiary rights and responsibilities, uh, as well as the application process, um, what that would look like kind of from, again, kind of from, from start to finish, but um, thinking a little bit around that uh, beneficiary experience. So moving on to provider rights and application process. Uh, this time we turned our attention to providers, um, thinking about provider rights, thinking about what it will look like for a provider to become a registered provider, um, really in that application process. Um, what are the things we're going to consider when it comes to rulemaking for the application process? We talked about provider registration requirements, um, what will be the um, minimum standards for provider registration to uh, be granted. And then we, uh, our last session here was regarding provider registration denial and termination. And so that would look at um, what would it mean if we, if a registration was not approved um, as well as terminated, and that could be terminated either by the provider themselves or by the department. So we've covered a lot in these sessions. Um, really, there's been so much dialogue around this, so many good things that we've taken away from it, um, but also just so many uh, different facets of this that we need to work through to be able to finalize our rules. We've had some key takeaways and, um, you know, really there's been so many. So I, so I tried to fit it into a slide at a high level, um, but know that each comment that's been uh, put into chat in the Q&A feature um, where folks have come off of mute and shared verbally 
uh, those are all things that we're taking into consideration. So each comment is something that we're, we're tracking, we're um, looking at how do we address. We can't necessarily address every comment because some, some of them are contradictory, um, but it's been really helpful for us to understand the different ways of looking at something or the different ways something could potentially seem very straightforward and end up being very complex. Um, so we've learned a lot during this process around those complexities, uh, especially when it comes to the current systems and how this program may impact the current systems. So some key takeaways that we've had here at a high level um, and what we've heard from folks is to focus on simplicity and clarity, keeping things as simple as possible, keeping them as clear as possible, um, trying to make sure that things are streamlined as much as possible for both beneficiaries and providers, knowing that they're likely going to be accessing this at a really challenging, especially for uh, beneficiaries accessing this at a challenging time in their life, um, and also needing services quickly from a provider. Um, so how do we make sure that we are being simple, we're being clear, um, and not making something too complicated for folks to navigate? We wanted to reduce barriers for beneficiaries and providers wanting to interact with the program. This ties right back into simplicity and clarity, but making sure that we're not putting undue barriers there uh, for beneficiaries or providers who want to be part of the program. We recognize that good services for beneficiaries are directly tied back to good services for providers. If the providers are there, then the beneficiaries can get services quicker, um, more directly. They can have a provider of their choice. And so how do we make sure that we are streamlining that as much as possible that um, we're able to, to serve the needs of both quickly? So when possible and practical, align with current workflows to reduce complexity, especially with provider registration steps and timelines. Uh, we heard a lot of feedback around um, what providers are experiencing currently with contracting with Medicaid, um, as well as the requirements associated with Medicaid. Um, seems to be we had a lot of folks who are very familiar with that uh, system already in most of our calls, which was really helpful for us to hear and understand more about. And so um, recognizing that wherever possible, we want to not reinvent the wheel. The wheel's already created in many ways for contracting. Um, and for those who, who may not have been part of um, some of our earlier discussions, contracting will be part of the provider registration process to make sure that providers can be paid as part of the DSHS requirement to have a contract for payment. Um, so making sure that we're use, utilizing current contracting practices that are already in the works. Um, we already have you know, a process in place, especially with the area agencies on aging. Um, so how do we kind of mirror that or use that to build a um, smooth process for our providers in walkers. We also value access, um, we've heard that we value accessible services for beneficiaries, including language access, provider access, and awareness of the challenges to rural communities. Um, this was a, a theme throughout, of course, of keeping that beneficiary in mind for us, um, of really how do we make sure that folks get the services they need timely? Um, how do we make sure that they're getting the services that meet their own needs? And that could look different for each person. Um, but also, how do we make sure that this is accessible and equitable for folks all throughout Washington, that there's not um, a better service delivery in um, areas, particularly more urban areas. We recognize, though, that there are ongoing issues throughout um, service delivery in rural communities, just due to the nature of being rural. Um, so we're working on, you know, thinking about how do we make sure that, you know, any barriers are not there for particularly rural communities, but how can we also incentivize service delivery in those areas. And then last, we have recognizing the impact to area agencies on aging, assisting with contracting providers. I've touched on this a few times, I think, along the way, um, but we really heard about um, how much, you know, again, a new process for our partners over at Area Agency on Aging who will be uh, potentially assisting us with, um, with contracting uh, and making sure that we're not creating an administrative burden there any more than is necessary with a new program. Um, so being really mindful and aware of those current systems that are in place and how can we uh, streamline that wherever possible and, uh, you know, mirror it or align with it uh, to keep that burden from uh, the folks who are going to be helping with contracting. 
So with that, again, this is high level. Some of this will fall outside of rulemaking. Some of this is stuff that we don't necessarily get to write a rule and say that this will happen. But these are good things for us to uh, be thinking about when it comes to rulemaking and going, how do we align with the values that we've heard throughout this whole series? Um, how do we make sure that we are keeping in mind all of these um, considerations when it comes to making rules and also uh, making sure we have a program that's flexible for people throughout Washington. So know that these aren't necessarily going to be addressed head on by rules, um, but we are going to be taking these pieces um, and really trying to interweave those values within the lower drafting. Some of these things can be addressed head on, and I want to be clear about that, and we can be really direct with our rulemaking in those areas. Um, but a lot of these are um, bigger you know, bigger concepts than just the rules themselves. Um, but again, I think they're very helpful for us to be um, considering when it comes to rulemaking. All right, and our last uh, topic here before we move to discussion is regarding potential upcoming rulemaking topics. So we've talked uh, again so far, kind of looking at the um, beneficiary eligibility and assessment. We've talked about provider registration. We've talked about approved services. We've talked about general provisions a little bit today. Um, and we recognize that those are kind of the, the biggest pieces for us to move forward with. But we do expect that we will have some rulemaking coming up on these other topics. And we're just not there yet in our process. We're not there yet you know, with our, um, with our resources. But we do expect likely to have some CR 101s being released potentially later this year, 2024 or early 2025. Um, and that's going to be on beneficiary appeals provider appeals, as well as addressing a third option for paying qualified family members, which was recently um, handed over to us from the Long-Term Services and Supports Commission, um, who met uh, just a little bit ago um, and gave us authority to move forward with rulemaking for that third option. Um, so stay tuned for that. And uh, one more plug for making sure that you are signed up for DSHS rulemaking uh, that gov delivery account so you'll be able to receive notifications about um, any filings we have on these topics all right we're going to move into the discussion and i am going to be opening up the chat to folks um, we are going to be pretty pretty straightforward on our questions so i'm going to look to you all to kind of let me know what you want to talk about um, within reason, again, we're focused on rulemaking here today. Uh, we're not going to be we're not going to be talking about uh, general program questions. Um, but if you have things that you know have come up for you as you've been thinking about past sessions or the stuff we've covered today, um, happy to hear it. So there's going to be multiple ways you're going to be able to interact with this discussion. Uh, you'll be able to raise your hand, and I will unmute you, um, or you can enter your comments in chat. And I have opened up the chat for folks here. Um, so you should be able to um, you should be able to put your comments in chat. All right, let's start with the first question. My question to you all is do you have any comments you would like to add that were not shared in past sessions? Or I'm going to add in another piece here. Uh, that was discussed today and you would like to make a comment about. So we're going to talk about past past sessions um, and we're also going to include today. Um, so any comments you would like to add? All right, I'm not seeing anything coming in yet, but I am very curious. Uh, looks like we have a pretty good group of people here, um, and some of which I know have been here before. Others may be joining us for um, maybe the first or second time, but very curious what comments you would like to add that were not shared in past sessions. And again, this is going to be regarding rulemaking, the topics we've covered about rulemaking. Um, and once again, not addressing general program questions here, 
um, but happy to uh, have those redirected over to our customer care team um, who will be able to answer those um, program related questions for you. All right. Well, I'm not hearing anything, and that's okay. Um, but I would assume that either means we've done such a good job that all the questions are answered and all the comments have been received, um, or potentially you're still processing. And either way is going to be just fine. Um, so if you're typing, keep typing. Um, we can come back to this at any point. Um, but we'll move on to our next question. Uh, which really, I'm just looking for feedback, knowing that we will likely be doing more of these in the future. Um, I would really love to hear from those who have been here before, or if this is your first time, how did it go? Um, looking at uh, just generally feedback, what went well, what could be changed to improve your experience? What would you like to see as we move forward and uh, do listening sessions in the future? Um, so very curious to hear from you all. Um, I will absolutely be using this feedback to improve and uh, figure out where where we can adapt and um, make this even better for you. All right, Kyle, I am, uh, I think you should be able to come, come off of mute now. Thank you. Um, so this is kind of for the previous question, and I've been very appreciative of this this whole series and opportunity for feedback. And the questions you've asked at all these have been fantastic questions. Um, thinking about one of the questions around in application processes for providers, um, how it could be simplified and accessible. Um, if there's could be like one website with the instructions on how providers can apply for the variety of opportunities for contracting, like Medicaid and wall cares, um, in one spot, then contract managers could have one website to to share with providers on what the application process is like for the different opportunities. That would be helpful in making it streamlined. I think that's a wonderful idea, Kyle. Um, I love the idea of one place to turn. And um, so thank you so much for bringing that up. And that is something certainly we'll take note of. Um, again, may, may be a bigger topic for us as we um, work with our Medicaid partners, but thinking about how do we support those providers and, and the people doing the work for contracting. I think that's great to hear and a great idea. So thank you for um, coming off of mute and sharing that, Kyle. All right, so I hear, I see a little bit in the uh, chat here and I'll admit that I'm not very good at accepting compliments. So I'll do my best here. Um, but Lindsay said, I love the way you moderated these listening sessions. Um, Beth said, I appreciate how the meetings are moderated. There's no one uh, no one talking over another and everyone's voice is heard. Um, so thank you both for uh, the great feedback. I really appreciate that. Um, and I'm curious, what else? Certainly very interested to hear your experience. And again, we can also go back to the past question. Um, if you have other comments, you're like, you know, I'm just thinking about it now, feel free to drop it in the chat or raise your hand. Uh, we can talk about both at the same time. All right, I see uh, some comments coming in, so thank you. Uh, Joan has said the meeting series has been great, especially on access to registration and receiving the PDF slide deck. I was also appreciative that all participants were heard and those posted their messages uh, you read very clearly. 
I would suggest being more regular in posting the decks and recordings on the Walkers Fun website. Sometimes it was prompt, but some were delayed. Thank you for the feedback on that, Joan. And we're certainly going to be working on speeding up that turnaround time. Um, so thank you for that. And we will work to improve. Lindsay said, uh, local AAAs or area agencies on aging are still concerned about how interpretation and translation is going to be made available to Walkers consumers. Um, and Stephen said, I agree. Ariel has been great. Nice job. Thanks. And thank you for uh, the kind words, Stephen. I appreciate that. Um, so for Lindsay, as far as the interpretation and translation, um, I do want to get into that a little bit further. Um, when you're referring to walkers, consumers, is that the beneficiary side or the provider side? Because I am doing quite a bit more research um, into that provider side, uh, but certainly very curious to hear uh, more about that. And Kyle said, uh, providing language line information on the beneficiary website, and Lindsay clarified both. Wonderful. Okay. Well, good to know um, that we still have some concerns about interpretation and translation on both sides. That is something we're working on delving into more. Um, and I know that at uh, one of our presentations, we had brought up a uh, provider right for interpretation and translated material. That sounds like that's not currently um, a service being provided on the Medicaid side. So that is a deviation in process from uh, what we're, what's currently being done. So that's something that we've very much noted and are trying to figure out. Um, most likely we're going to align uh, wherever possible with what's currently in place, but recognizing, you know, is there a way we can do better with equity, you know, equity and, and inclusion and making sure we have language access, but much more to come, still very much researching that. Same with the beneficiary side. Um, so I, I don't have anything to alleviate the concerns, but I appreciate hearing that that is something that's still out on folks' minds. Um, and hopefully I can reassure a little bit that uh, we are still looking into that, trying to, trying to figure out how that's going to look for walkers. All right, what else? So give us just maybe another minute here to uh, process and then we will start closing up. Um, but certainly if the conversation keeps moving, we'll, we'll keep engaging, so no worries there. Um, so Connie said, please make sure WACARES fund service definitions are clear and consistent between how are they described in rulemaking on a website in the AAA contract, um, and AAA being the Area Agency on Aging contract, and in the WACARES fund provider contracts. Um, that's a great point, Connie, and certainly one near and dear to my heart um, when it comes to language consistency and making sure that we have um, consistent language throughout and that we're using the word in the same way. And I think those on my team who are here on the call may be chuckling because of how many times I bring that up. Um, so good to hear we're aligned there, Connie, and I think that that's something we will continue to work, for, work towards uh, when it comes to language development for this program. All right, Kyle, and I see your hands raised. If you want to unmute, you're welcome to do so. Um, I can't remember if this come up, this has come up in past rulemaking, but if there's a possibility of a tool that assists beneficiaries with managing the benefit balance, um, that there could be a, um, a delay in using the service and then that provider, you know, billing for the service. So, um, you know, making sure people are set up for success and not accidentally thinking that they have a larger balance than they they do if there's a provider who's delayed in, in invoicing for a service. Yeah, you bet. I um, know our tech team has been working very diligently on that prop, um, that uh, issue. Um, and how do we make sure that we have a really good system for folks knowing their balance right away? Um, so I can't speak too much about that because I'm not in that as deeply as they are, but I do know that that is um, something that our tech team is very uh, working very hard on. Um, so I don't necessarily expect that to be in rule, um, just for you all to know, um, but we do expect that to be part of the beneficiary experiences, um, some support around and um, fairly uh, accurate and timely reporting of what their balance is so they know how to know, they know what's available to them. All right. 
Yeah, and Dan asked about um, sharing the next steps and typing for the rest of the process. Yeah, so right now we are um, working on our initial drafts. Um, we have uh, kind of the initial stage uh, for our beneficiary side going through um, kind of the initial uh, drafter being reviewed a little bit by team members. We're still very much chewing on it. Um, same with the provider side. We're on the initial drafting stage there. We expect to be reviewing it internally just within the rulemaking team, probably starting in August, and then it'll start working its way out from there. Our goal is to have a 102 filed for the beneficiary rules um, probably by late 2024 um, with the provider rules um, with the exception of that third, um, the third option for qualified family members uh, for payment, um, that's again going to be running a separate, a separate path. Um, but for the rest of the provider rules, hoping probably for a filing of a 102 by late uh, 2024, early 2025. Um, so within that, we'll we'll be doing um, some review periods and, um, you know, working through it internally. Uh, and then making sure that we're um, moving on along in the process for that 102. Uh, with that, we expect hopefully the 103 for the beneficiary side to be um, filed in probably spring of 2025, um, pending you know the rulemaking process. And then the provider side would be shortly thereafter, probably um, late spring, early summer. So I hope that gives you a general idea. This is very much in the works. We're again, very much in the drafting stage right now. So that's been, uh, so it's hard to predict, you know, how much uh, revision we're gonna do before it goes, you know, starts moving along in the process. But uh, we are working on some timelines right now uh, with the information we know and our current status. Um, so hopefully we'll be locking that in a little bit more and being able to communicate more specifically about our projected timelines as we uh, get there. But. Um, things should be moving along. And then again, we're expecting some uh, 101, CR 101s to happen on um, beneficiary appeals, provider appeals, and that third option, um, that third payment option for qualified family members, probably sometime in 2024. All right. I hope that was helpful, Dan. Um, and Kyle also put in the chat, the information beneficiaries receive highlighting that Walkers has no co-pays. Okay. Wonderful. All right. Well, I am uh, looking like the, ch the chat's slowing down just a little bit. So I will move us along. But if you're typing, keep typing. Uh, we don't have to necessarily stop just because I move forward. Um, but uh, it looks like things are slowing down just a little bit. All right, once again, I'm gonna give you some resources here in the chat. Um, it's also up on the slide. It'll be in the slide deck, of course, as well, once this is posted. Um, I wanna do one more reminder about the Walk Cares Fund rulemaking site for DSHS. That's the first link there. Um, please make sure you go there, you check it out, you check by every so often to see what's going on. Um, but also make sure that you're signed up for those gov delivery notifications so you can stay in the loop of rulemaking. We have the Employment Security Department rulemaking website as well. They're doing rulemaking right now on Walk Cares, uh, so please make sure um, to check over there. We have the Healthcare Authority website. Uh, they'll be doing rulemaking in 2025 for Walk Cares, um, so you know keep in touch with them and uh, know that there'll be there'll be some rulemaking happening there. You can send over questions regarding the program to walkers at dshs.wa.gov, and you can send questions about the Walkers Fund rulemaking process. Anything we've talked about so far, any questions, concerns you have, any ideas you want to share, you can send those over to me at ariel.finney2 at dshs.wa.gov. Um, so I hope that that's helpful. Um, Kyle has dropped in the chat saying clarity on if the Walkers benefit will be considered private pay. Um, and at this point, uh, Kyle, we are working through that um, to confirm, but so far I think it's fairly safe to say it's not considered private pay um, because it is uh, really a, a benefit here. So we'll get into that a little at a deeper level, um, you know, either in rulemaking or, or in just information about the policy, but we are working through to confirm that at this point it's not considered 
um, what, what in most contexts, private pay. So I hope that helps a little bit. All right, one more time, I wanna say thank you all for being here, for participating, um, for showing up each time and giving me something in the chat to work with. I really appreciate it. I couldn't be doing this without you. And I would have been very, uh, very quiet and lonely here if you if you weren't here to participate and engage in the material I've presented to you. Um, no, we'll be doing more of these as we move forward. Um, so if you have any feedback, uh, feel free to share with me at any time. I appreciate the good. I really appreciate the bad, just so I know how to improve and how to make sure that this feels like a meaningful process to you. Um, so with that, I hope you all have a wonderful day. Thanks for your time and um, look forward to chatting with you next time.